Hello, my kiddos. So here we go. Uh, this is kind of kind of tied together with some random things. So I've already posted the lab explanation out on YouTube. So that's there. Look for that on the AP Chem list. And so uh, one of the things we're going to talk about is this concept of enthalpy. So enthalpy is important, but it's really, really difficult to measure directly because you're talking about energy involved in breaking and forming bonds. And it isn't like we can like look at it and say, oh, well, here we broke this hydrogen bond and this is the actual energy that's involved with it. So we have to look at what's happening in the surroundings. So when you go through how you can calculate enthalpy, and eventually we're gonna go through all four of these. Hess's law, we'll get into that later. Don't worry about that. Measuring the heat given to the surroundings. So this is the whole point of the lab that you're going to do. So like on the first one, and this will make sense, you took a cup of water and you added uh, some a salt to it. And what you saw was that the temperature of the water decreased. So that means that it's an endothermic reaction. So Q for the surroundings is a negative number because the temperature dropped, because you're taking temperature final minus temperature initial. And if I remember right, I think it dropped to like, uh, I think the final temperature was 19.1 and the initial temperature was like 20. So you got a negative change of 0.9 degrees Celsius, which means when you calculate Q using M delta T C sub P, you can have a negative value. But what the importance of that is that that's a negative Q for the surroundings. So for the system, that means that you're going to have the same numeric value, but a positive Q. We'll get to that more in the lab. So that's going to be one thing. So the sum of the enthalpies of formation and thermodynamic data, we'll get to that eventually. And what we're going to do today is this, calculate using bond enthalpies, okay? So here's your golden rule about bonds, okay? There's no exception to this. When you, you're you going to break a bond, okay, you have to put energy into the system, okay? As basically, it, it's imagined that you have a spring and you're stretching the spring, okay? And so as you stretch that, you're storing this potential energy until it basically snaps. So when you put energy in, you break bonds. The converse of that is that when you see energy being released in an exothermic reaction, that means that you're forma forming the bonds because now you're, you're putting these together, you're decreasing that energy, and that energy has to go somewhere. So here's your golden rule, okay? Begin to, begin to understand this. When you break bonds, energy put in. It costs you, you have an input of energy. It's what you have to pay. When energy is released, that's what you get out of the system. So you put energy, money in, you put it, have an input of energy to break bonds, and then you get that out. So when we're looking at this, and here's kind of the short summary. Let me go back that is that in an endothermic process, and this is what this is a nice part of the slab, you're going to see an endothermic process and then an exothermic process. So in an endothermic process, you end up with less energy. In an exothermic process, you're going to end up with energy being released. Okay? So, and again, if you look at this just purely from the perspective of energy, so most reactions you'll see are exothermic. You look at, you burn wood in the fireplace. It's an exothermic reaction. So the energy that's released in the formation of the new bonds is more than the energy that was input into breaking the bonds that hold the wood together. Okay, that's the whole thing. So here's what we're going to look at. So we're going to look at this in terms of a simple example. So we're going to talk about the combustion of methane. CH4 and an oxygen to produce carbon dioxide and water. So if you have these numbers, and, and this is what we've got on this chart. So 
Let's talk about the CH4. So that's a carbon surrounded by four hydrogens, okay? So when you look at this, we've got to break four of these bonds. So we're going to use this idea that my change in enthalpy is going to be bonds broken minus bonds formed. So in this situation, I, and you got the sigma, which is going to be sum. So I've got one mole of methane, CH4. So I'm going to take, to break a single carbon-hydrogen bond requires an input of 413 joules. So this is going to be 413 times 4, which gets you 1652. So per mole of methane, that's going to require an input of 1,652 joules to break the bonds. Now, on your oxygen side, okay? So on your oxygen side, and that's going to be this number right here, so that's 495, but I've got two moles of my oxygens, okay? Because, because of that coefficient. Remember, that 2 means that I've got two moles. So I'm going to take 495 times 2, and that's going to get me 990. So when I add all of this up on the energy input that it's going to take to break bonds, I got 2642. Okay? There you go. So the energy input to break all of the bonds that hold the methane together and the oxygen is 2642. Now I need to work on what's going to happen with the carbon dioxide. Now with the CO2... And we'll spend more time talking about molecular structure later. But this is, carbon has four valence electrons, and there's an oxygen, okay? Which means these are going to be double bonds. So I've got to use the 799. Now, here's the other thing, that when you look at this in terms of trends. Notice that if there's a single bond between the carbon and the oxygen, that's just 358. If there's a double bond, notice that that number has shot up to 800. So the more bonds there are between carbon and or anything else, the more bonds there are, the more energy it takes to break those bonds, which should make sense. So on the carbon dioxide, I've got two of these bonds. So I'm going to take, on the carbon dioxide, I'm going to take 799, times 2, and there's no coefficient out in front, so that's just going to be 799 times 2, which gets you 1598. Now, on the water, the water's a little bit complicated. So on the water, I've got an oxygen and a hydrogen here. So within the water molecule itself, okay, I've got to input 467, times two, which that 467 is how much energy it takes to break a carbon or an oxygen-hydrogen bond. So that's per molecule, per mole of molecules, but in the balanced equation, I've got two moles of those. So basically, I'm going to take 467 times four, and that's going to get me uh, 1868. So here's what I've got. So I've got an input of 2,642 joules to break all the bonds. The energy released in the formation of bonds, if you add all of that up, you get 3,466. Well, one too many. So here's the deal. So when I take 2,642, which is my energy input to break the bonds, and then I subtract the 3,466, I get a negative 824. Now, that should make sense because of the fact that this is, burning methane is an exothermic reaction. This is why we burn methane to heat up water or to heat our homes or to barbecue. If this had worked out to be a positive number, okay, that would mean burning methane was an endothermic reaction and it would actually draw energy in from the environment and we would use it to make ice, okay? 
So what you're going to see here is that we have a negative delta H. And one of the things that you really have to begin to understand is that the signs of your delta H's. So I've got a negative delta H. It's an exothermic reaction. Energy is going to be released. Now, we'll get to how to do the one with the water later on, okay? Not in this lesson, but we'll get to this one. But here's what's important. Notice that this is a negative delta H, okay? It's an exothermic reaction, which is why when you combust a hydrogen balloon with oxygen in the air, it's an exothermic reaction, and you feel that as heat. Okay, so here's the lab, that the data that I'm going to send out. So on the first part, and, and watch this video, because or if you haven't already watched the video, basically we took 50 grams of water, we added hydrated copper sulfate, and here's the molar mass of that, so you don't have to do the calculations. Hydrated just means that there's water molecules attached. So you've got you have to go through and you've got to calculate in here the moles of copper sulfate, maybe do that off to the side. Then I took the initial temperature of the water, which is 22 degrees, and then, oh, I screwed that up. Hold on, I'm gonna change this. This is actually gonna be 20 degrees, or we're gonna get numbers completely jacked up. That, that should be 20 degrees. I'm gonna change that in the lab before I send it out. This is actually 20 degrees. So. Your change in temperature is going to be negative 0.9 degrees Celsius. So here's what's important. So this little bit down here, okay, here's what I'm showing you, is that Q for the solution, in this case, is going to be have the opposite sign for the reaction. So what we're worried about here is this number. So... What you're going to do is you're going to calculate Q for the solution or the surroundings. It's the same thing. You're going to take the mass of the water plus the mass of the salt, which is going to be these two numbers added together. Your change in temperature is going to be negative 0.9, and then you have the specific heat of water. So what you've got here, listen to me, listen to me, listen to me. Q for the solution is going to be a negative number. So Q for the reaction, then it's going to have the opposite sign, which is going to be a positive value. Then you're going to take that Q, divide it by your number of moles, and that's how you're going to get the, an experimental value of your delta H for the enthalpy. So because of the fact that this is a negative value, what that means is that we had an input of energy we put more energy in. So what happened is that if you look at CuSO4 dot 5H2O, when you dissolved it or the dissolution process, you had to break these bonds, okay? And so you had an input of energy to break the bonds. Therefore, more energy was put in and instead of forming new bonds, we put more energy in to break the bonds. This is why it's an endothermic reaction. Now, what the 11.74 here, what this number is right here, this is the accepted value for the delta H for the enthalpy. Okay, don't multiply. I'm not telling you to multiply this together. You're just going to need this number down here when you calculate the uh, experimental error. Okay, so don't, and it's the same thing here when you get to the next one. This is just the accepted value. Don't multiply these together. Don't. Stop. Don't. Okay? Now, in contrast to what's going to happen on the next one, and this is what I put on the film, this one started at 20, and it actually went up to 26 degrees. So this is a very exothermic reaction. Energy is being released. So that means when you take temperature final minus temperature initial, this is going to get you 6 degrees Celsius. So in this case, Q for the surroundings, or for the solution, is a positive value. So Q for the reaction is going to be a negative value because they're opposite signs. That's going to indicate that it is an exothermic reaction. So this first one is endo. The second one is exo. Now, you got a bunch of questions to answer 
on this, and when I'm talking about dissolution, I'm just talking about the dissolving process, okay? And keep track if I'm talking about the hydrated or the anhydrous. Uh, now, when you get down here, so this is like the next page of the lab. So you got a bunch of questions to answer about the lab. So this is kind of this, more of this idea of breaking bonds. Now, let me kind of give you what I want here. I said, how many bonds are broken in one molecule of iodine and what energy is involved? So in, you have I2, right? So that's just going to be, I'm going to break one of these bonds because it's just I2, right? So that's going to be one, and that's going to then be uh, 150 joules, okay? That's just that answer right there. Now, let me explain what I'm looking for with chlorine. So the chlorine... And this is what I kind of showed you up above. So the chlorine bonds are 240. But because there's a three in front of those, I have to break three moles of chlorine bonds. So that's what I'm asking for here. So this first answer here is that how many bonds are broken in all the chlorine molecules and what is the energy involved in breaking the bonds in three? So on the chlorine molecule, each one is going to involve breaking one bond, okay? But... There's three of them because there's three molecules that you have to break. So this is going to be three. And then to get the energy involved, that's going to be 240 times three. So that's, that's what I'm looking for in terms of how you're going to answer these questions. Okay, kids, uh, I'm going to send this out. Uh, tomorrow during the, during the study session, I can answer any questions on that assignment that I gave you all yesterday and also on this one. So watch the YouTube video that explains the lab and then watch this one. So that's